tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Mood. So what's on tap for 420 this year? A comedy on the tube? Some tunes on the stereo? Log in some good old couch time. Doesn't matter, folks, as long as you're baked like a batch of cookies with Mood. Mood is our favorite provider of federally legal THC products. They've got all the goods. Vapes, edibles, hash, drops, dab batter, moon rocks, everything. Each specially designed to provide just the mood you're after. All pesticide-free, sourced from small family farms and regularly tested in third-party labs. Celebrate 420 exactly how you want to with Mood. Get 20% off your first order plus a free THCA pre-roll at hellomood.com with promo code CHILLING. That's hellomood.com code CHILLING. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about paralyzing points of view and persistent pests. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of James Flynn and Charles Williams are voice talents Jeff Sturdivant and Otis Jiry. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by James Flynn and performed by Jeff Sturdivant. This story is more of a philosophical horror and explores the idea that life can be viewed as a glorious gift or a horrible nightmare. Now, without further ado, I present to you The Beautiful Nightmare. There was a spring in Deuce's step as he crossed the busy street. Life was good. He could feel it. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and the pavements bustled with attractive people exuding confidence. And by all accounts, Deuce certainly didn't look out of place amongst this wave of vibrant humanity. His new clothes turned heads every few meters. His fresh haircut caught the gazes of female students drinking at outside cafes. And the confidence that laced his stride seemed to draw strangers into his close proximity. Things were looking up for young Deuce. Life was sweet indeed, and he was lapping it up. A mere two weeks into his new job at a stockbroking firm, and he'd already made a good impression on his boss, 
earned high praise from co-workers and clients alike, and successfully secured a date with a pretty young lady in the admin department. Deuce was on a roll, for sure. He was now on his lunch break, and hunger called. Halfway down the road, there was a sandwich shop, and Deuce sauntered toward it, smiling and nodding to random passersby as he went. Tall buildings lined the long street on either side, each one painted in soothing pastel colors that reflected the midday sun that beamed down from above. An endless array of shops and stores displayed their sparkling consumer goods, and shopkeepers and street vendors coaxed potential customers with warm smiles and well-rehearsed dialogue. Shiny automobiles rolled by, emblems of success, metallic paintwork glistening. Music blasted from balconies overhead, and likewise, department stores down on ground level played catchy, luring tunes from their own doorway speakers as shoppers came and went. The town was alive, and Deuce soaked up its life force as he walked through its heart. The glorious atmosphere enveloped him. The frenetic vibes consumed him, and as he made his way to the sandwich shop, he felt the pleasing sense of being in the prime of his life. Then it happened. A few paces away from the sandwich shop, Deuce experienced a strange sensation. Drawing to a halt on the pavement, he stood there idly, his arms dangling by his sides. Pedestrians brushed past him as he dazedly looked around. Dogs sniffed his ankles and diners in nearby restaurants looked up from their plates when they noticed him there. Something had changed. Something had altered. The buildings surrounding him were suddenly draped in a different light. The shadows between benches and lampposts had grown darker, and the atmosphere of the entire street had undergone a perceptual transformation. Raising his head toward the sky... Deuce found the cause of this transformation. A light wind had caused a cloud to drift steadily across the sky, obscuring the sun. This drifting cloud cover cast the entire street in a different light, altering its hue and making it a negative photo film. In fact, as Deuce stood there, shell-shocked, he no longer recognized the street at all. It looked like a different part of town, he was so confused and bewildered by what he was seeing, he actually wondered whether he'd walked onto an adjacent street at some point without realizing it. The buildings and apartment blocks had lost their colorful sheen. Their facades were now only squat, muted stones that begrudgingly stood over the drab street, ready to crumble to dust at the lightest brush of a finger. The pedestrian shouldering past him now belonged to a different breed, their skin was less rosy, their hair had lost its gloss, and the underlying kinship that Deuce had previously felt oozing from them had morphed into hostility and competition. They didn't come across as fellow companions in the game of life anymore. They didn't carry the air of fellows who would happily give directions or the time of day. Instead, they were rivals in the ruthless competition of survival and replication. Conversations became whispers, laughs became sneers, and smiles became side glances. Even the shopkeepers had changed. They were no longer friendly, amiable, and helpful. It was obvious to Deuce now, as he stared cautiously over at them from the section of pavement on which he stood, that their sole intention was to get as much money from him as possible, to empty his bank account of funds. The idea that these greedy shop owners and shopkeepers were on his side in any way seemed more and more absurd as Deuce observed them under the gray shade of the passing cloud, and he felt foolish for being so naive beforehand. Cars continued to pass on the road, but they were no longer the same. The shiny, glamorous vehicles Deuce had seen a few moments ago had morphed into polluting smog machines that coughed ugly carcinogens into the air as they dragged their rusting bulk along the tarmac, 
oil churning within the greasy confines of their engines. The music blasting out from the department stores and apartments took on a different tone. The rhythm and melody faded away, and the upbeat cadence became downbeat. The lyrics lost their positivity, and the words now sounded pleading and desperate to Deuce's ears. Listening to the grating noise, I wondered how anyone could produce such repetitive, cheap tat on earth. Money. It's all about money and profit. Deuce pictured a group of executives and businessmen in a music studio somewhere, trying to figure out the best way to line their pockets some more. He imagined them drawing up investment and marketing plans, viewing the songs with pound signs floating before their eyes, thinking in terms of monetary profit, not musical art. It wasn't only the music that had changed its tune, either. Even the high-pitched tweets of the birds in the trees began to catch Deuce's attention in a new way. The previously happy, chirpy edge to the avian sounds had vaporized, replaced by desperate, terrified screeches that betrayed the creature's panicked struggle for survival. The birds no longer sang. They cried for help. Even the trees in which they fluttered to and fro took on a dismal transmogrification. The leaves ceased to be bright green palms. Underneath the cold gray blanket of cloud cover, Deuce could now see the tree's leaves for what they really were. Organic solar panels reaching desperately into the air, fighting to soak up any scraps of sunlight they could in order to stop the tree from withering and dying. Struggle and Desperation Everything's about struggle and desperation. As the seconds wore on, the clouds still blocking the sun's face, Deuce made a conscious effort to rise above this mysterious wave of depression and snap himself back to his previous state of harmony, but he couldn't. The visual alteration caused by the passing cloud was too strong, too heavy, and too all-encompassing to simply shrug off and walk away from. If anything, its paralyzing effect intensified. Deuce's musings and observations became deeper, more detailed, and more philosophical, to the point where he began to question the very nature of his presence and existence on the planet. His job didn't seem so perky anymore. A few weeks ago, he'd been able to kid himself that his boss had employed him because he liked him on a personal level, but this idea was now laughable at best. Of course he'd been employed based on what he had to offer the company, or more specifically, how much money he could generate for the company. It was obvious to Deuce now, as his brain rationally analyzed things, that he would be replaced as soon as someone else turned up who was more cunning and resourceful than he was. Even his new clothes didn't feel soothing against his skin anymore. Under the flat gray carpet of cloud, the fabric of his shirt and suit jacket felt itchy and starchy, and loose threads scratched his arms and back as he fidgeted and squirmed in the middle of the street. Cynical questions and queries echoed in his head. Where were these garments made? Who picked the cotton? Who stitched them together? How much were they paid? What kind of carbon footprint was created in their manufacturing and delivery? With the sun still obscured, the cogs of his brain operating in a realm of non-chromatics, he swiftly concluded that, in all probability, his garments had been made and manufactured in a sweaty factory in a run-down corner of the globe, woven and stitched by hungry, impoverished fingers. A woman shouldered past him, shooting him an evil glare, and Deuce was reminded of the woman he'd managed to chat up at work. Back in his positive mental frame, the date had represented a glorious accomplishment, a triumph of courage and sexuality. But now it seemed like a disaster waiting to happen, Every trace of confidence that he'd previously possessed had been drained away from him. Every scrap of charisma that leaked from his sweaty pores. 
and the sheer idea of entertaining a woman for an entire evening was tantamount to a fantastical superhuman endeavor. And even if he did manage to successfully woo this woman, it would still amount to a tragedy, Deuce reasoned. He knew full well that human beings only spend time with other human beings if there's something to be gained from it. Friends will only spend time with other friends if they provide entertainment. Acquaintances will only spend time with other acquaintances if they provide a boost to their careers. And women will only spend time with men if they provide some kind of security or resource. What a fool, thought Deuce. In her eyes, nothing but a walking ATM machine. Time lost its meaning as Deuce stood there by the roadside. It could have been seconds ago that the cloud had drifted across the sphere of the sun, or it could have been hours. He simply didn't know. The sun was still covered, though. He knew that much. The drifting puff of cloud still buffered the solar rays, and the entire street had the appearance of a photograph that had been put through a monochrome filter on a smartphone. The exposure had been decreased. The highlights had been reduced. The saturation had been siphoned away. And the contrast had been swiped down to zero. The lampposts, trees, and buildings were less than gray. Their sheen fell below flatness. The atmospheric anemia permeated so deeply into their surfaces that they all looked ready to melt away. Shifting his eyes left and right, Deuce began to see what wasn't there instead of what was. He saw the extra height and space of what the apartment buildings could have had if more money had been available to the architects who had designed them. He saw the missing beauty and charisma that the passing pedestrians could have had if they possessed better genes. He saw the more desirable occupations that the shopkeepers could have had if they'd been born into wealthier families and he saw the level of cleanliness and sanitation that the street could have had if the local council had more funds and enthusiasm to make it happen. Deuce's thoughts were bleak, but they got bleaker. Trapped in this gray neurosis, he could see that even if the buildings around him had more height and space, the pedestrians possessed better genes, the shopkeepers had better occupations, and the street was cleaner... It wouldn't really matter anyway. The buildings, the people, and the street would hold no greater meaning or purpose, even if they boasted these improvements. Alas, they would still amount to nothing other than clusters of atoms and DNA. Beads of sweat trickled down Deuce's forehead as he dawdled and fidgeted on the pavement, unable to jerk himself out of the powerful inertia that had taken hold of him. A car drove past, and he saw it as the worn-out, scrapped heap of metal that it would become one day. A man walked by on the other side of the road, and he envisioned the moldy, forgotten gravestone that he would one day be buried underneath. Trees became kindling, birds became taxidermy and waiting and shops became failed businesses with boarded-up windows. Everything around him amounted to tragedy, desperation, and decay. Nothing more, nothing less. Deuce felt like crying or screaming out in despair, but before he could, his thoughts grew bleaker still. On a subconscious level, Deuce had always felt lucky for having been born, He'd always held an unspoken gratitude toward his parents for creating him and giving birth to him. He'd always felt blessed for being alive. Standing there on the street, however, the infected wiring of his brain making calculations under the slate gray sky, his existence seemed more and more like a horrible misfortune. Eight decades of toil, then a steady decline to the grave. A man and woman passed by, pushing a pram. Peering over at them, Deuce felt pity for the poor baby lying in the pram, and anger and hatred toward the two parents for bringing it into existence. 
The baby obviously had not been given any choice regarding its birth, had never been asked beforehand whether it wanted to live or not, so how dare they give birth to it without its consent? Creating a human life, then exposing it to the world's dangers, seemed like the ultimate cruelty to Deuce as he gazed down at the passing pram, and he had to fight the urge to voice his opinions as the two parents shuffled by. Lucky to be alive. What a sick joke. Deuce snapped. The dark epiphanies became unbearable, and he simply couldn't handle them anymore. He could see now that the glass would always be half empty, not half full, and the prospect of living the rest of his life carrying this grim knowledge was unfeasible. It made more sense to cut things short, to reduce the suffering to lessen the extent of the torment. Suicide. The ultimate savior. On the other side of the street, a pharmacy caught his eye, its medicinal window display beckoning him with its selection of potent drugs. Apartment balconies called out to him from overhead, their lofty heights full of lethal promise. A car beeped its horn as it thundered past, its thick tires spraying stones and grit into the air. Yes, that's it. A simple head-on collision. Deuce dragged his fatigued body toward the curb and scanned the road for a suitable vehicle. In the semi-distance, a large SUV appeared, moving at an excessive speed, and it looked dangerous enough to do the job. Planting his toes on the curb's edge, he prepared himself for the jump into oblivion. He didn't feel particularly fearful. If anything, he felt anxious and eager to get it over and done with. The vehicle raced down the road, speeding towards him, its front bumper a clenched fist, carrying the gift of death. Deuce bent his knees. Three, two, one. Deuce was milliseconds away from springing himself into the road, but something stopped him. He didn't consciously know what this something was, but it was strong enough to prevent him from making the jump. The car drove by, accelerating down the road. As it sped past... Deuce noticed that its paintwork was colorful. Blinking in confusion, he then looked around at the shops and passing crowds. To his astonishment, they too had regained their former color and vibrancy. Tilting his head, Deuce could see that the sky was blue once again, and the sun was no longer obscured. The cloud was still there, but the wind had carried it further west, allowing the sun to beam its hot rays upon the street once again. The buildings breathed with life, the trees were healthy, and the sparrows that fluttered from branch to branch no longer sounded scared or desperate, their chirps carrying an air of melody and contentment instead. Happy faces passed him on the street, friends, not foes, allies, not enemies. The air felt warm upon his skin, and the secure sense of human kinship was back in full force. The shops that lined the street looked fresh, new, and inviting, and their displayed products were designed to make his life easier. The shopkeepers were his brothers. The waitresses in the coffee shops were his sisters. Deuce waved at one of them, and they waved back. The department stores were still blasting music from their entrances, but now the songs and melodies caused the hair on the back of Deuce's neck to stand endwise. Tapping his foot to the beat, he thought whoever made the song was a talented musician. Rocking to the music, Deuce looked down at himself and remembered how good he looked. His shoes shone with a thick layer of polish, his trousers were ironed to perfection, and his shirt fit so well it accentuated the curves of his well-muscled chest. Dressed to kill. 
He then began to wonder what he was going to wear on his date. Would he go casual or smart casual? After all, the woman from the admin department was hot, so it was worth making an effort. I'll think about this later on. Right now, I'm starving. Deuce's appetite had returned with a vengeance, and the sight of the sandwich shop up ahead caused his mouth to water. He was ten minutes into his lunch break now, and he hadn't eaten a single thing. What was going on? It was time to wolf down a triple club sandwich with all the trimmings, and then maybe something sweet afterward. He was an important man, after all, and if he was to retain his stature at work as Mr. Popular... He would need some decent sustenance. Head held high with a spring in his step, Deuce walked down the road. Life was good. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Mood. How do you celebrate 420, folks? Besides getting high, of course. That's kind of a given. Any special movies you watch or music you'd like to listen to? Or do you sit there and have a staring contest with the rotary gerfer? Uh, that's refrigerator backwards. I ain't judging whatever you're in the mood for, right? Speaking of moods... If you're looking for the finest purveyor of legal THC products in the galaxy this 420, you're going to want to visit our friends at hellomood.com. They've got an enormous selection of products to choose from. Vapes, edibles, drops, hash, moon rocks, freezer pops, taffies, peach rings. I could go on and on. And of course, their incredibly potent THCA flower, their most powerful breakthrough in the world of legal cannabis. But here's what makes Mood really special. Their in-house experts tailor and test each product for just the feeling you're after. They mix and match from 10 different strains to give each product certain qualities. They've got chill and sleepy choices like their cereal milk and Top Gun pre-rolls. They've got creative choices like their Pluto THCA flower. And they've got others to make you feel euphoric, or aroused. So whatever high you're looking for, they've got just the thing you're after. No guessing games. Now I'm partial to Mood's sleepy and chill products. My latest acquisition is their North Carolina grown Counting Sheep THCA flower. It's an indica hybrid guaranteed to usher you off to the land of Nod. And let me tell you, my wife is so happy I'll watch her shows with her these days, she thinks I'm actually watching. Anyway, I'm just totally passed out. Great life hack. Totally recommended. Celebrate 420 exactly how you want to. With Mood, get 20% off your first order plus a free THCA pre-roll at hellomood.com with promo code CHILLING. That's hellomood.com code CHILLING. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I hope you enjoyed The Beautiful Nightmare, as written by James Flynn and performed by Jeff Sturdivant. Our second tale of the evening is written by Charles Williams and performed by Otis Gyrie. In it, a serial killer revisits the body of one of his victims in an isolated location in the forest. Rather than enjoying the encounter, Millard Frost is annoyed by a persistent blowfly who has discovered the corpse. Now, without further ado, I present to you Blowfly Blues. The beauty of the moonless night was not lost on Millard Frost. He loved the dark and always had. The blackness that cradled his van as he navigated the twisting mountain road gave him a sense of comfort. He'd lived most of his life in the company of shadows, 
and he thought of them as good friends who helped him conceal many secrets. Millard traveled this road many times before, the last being just two days ago. He trusted it to be deserted at this time of night, and he was not disappointed. The surrounding mountains and tall pines blocked out the stars, making it difficult to spot the landmarks that would tell him the entrance to the logging road was near. A solitary metal post marking the beginning of the dirt road suddenly appeared on his right. He could not stop in time to make the turn and slammed on the van's brakes. He could back up and steer down the narrow path with no other cars around. Puffs of dust followed the van as it suffered the potholes of neglect. Millard continued his route slowly, following the high beams that faded into the pitch-black emptiness ahead. He checked the odometer and made a mental note of the last number. His destination lay exactly four miles ahead, and there was no way he'd be able to find it without the instrument's help. Time would not be an enemy during his evening tasks. His wife and two children had taken advantage of an early spring break and left for Easter with her parents in Murphy's Landing. Millard would join them after tying up a few sluice ends at work later that week. No one would be trying to contact him so late at night. The rugged byway continued to guide the white van into the depths of the Stanislaus National Forest. Millard was two miles from his destination when a large doe emerged from the thicket on the left side. He instinctively hit the brakes as the deer stopped in front of him and stared into the headlights. He fought the impulse to speed ahead and attempt to hit the animal. It wouldn't be worth the thrill if he damaged the car and then got stuck in this isolated spot. There'd be too many questions to answer and too much attention given to a place Millard strived to keep very private. As the odometer gradually reached the four-mile mark, Millard pulled the van as far over to the right as he could. The lower branches of a small sugar pine made their presence known to the vehicle's passenger side. He turned off the lights and got out. After opening the back of the van, he removed a cordless mini chainsaw, flashlight, plastic gloves and a disposable paint suit. He slipped into the plastic coveralls and covered his head with the attached hood. He then placed everything else into a plastic grocery bag and began to explore the wilderness around him. Seven days ago, he placed a small pile of rocks at the base of a large pine on the right side of the logging road as a marker to show where he had entered the forest. Now he focused the flashlight at the bottom of the tree line to find them. He realized that his calculations at the location would be inexact, but he still felt a rising sense of frustration when he couldn't find the tiny cairn right away. He walked deliberately down the dirt path, the white plastic suit and swinging flashlight, creating a ghostly silhouette. About a hundred yards from the place where he parked the van, he spotted the small stack of rocks. He was aware that he still had a ten-minute walk ahead of him, but he wasn't worried about finding what he was looking for. Dead bodies were hard to miss after a week, even in the dark. Millard considered the past day's events as he trudged toward his destination. He enjoyed stalking his prey the most, the feeling that he would soon have complete control over the person he was watching. The abduction was always the trickiest part. So many variables were involved so many ways that things could go wrong. Careful planning was the key, and each situation brought its own challenges. Street captures were surprisingly the easiest. Working girls operated in the shadows, too, and they were so easy to convince to get into the van. There must never be a personal connection with the target, however. That was one of the mistakes that serial killers who were caught always made. Another was the failure to clean up properly. Frenzied kills led to careless mistakes. Besides, Millard liked to take his time. Pulling the wings off the fly was how he liked to describe it. Millard did have one potentially fatal idiosyncrasy associated with his kills, though. However, he enjoyed going back to revisit his work despite the risk. The smell of a bloated, decomposing body held a carnal fascination for him. 
He was not one of those killers who kept souvenirs, and he was not a necrophiliac. The olfactory part of his brain, sharing the smell of putrefaction with his limbic system, imprinted the memory in a way that allowed him to relive his experiences repeatedly. Dismemberment and scattering of the body parts followed his ritual farewell. The stuttering hoots of a great horned owl echoed into the night. As dried pine needles crunched beneath his feet, Millard followed the path that the narrow beam of his mini flashlight opened in the forest. He knew he should be getting close. The remote location had made an excellent killing field, although lugging an unconscious person for half a mile could be difficult depending on their size. Fortunately, the adrenaline boost fueled by anticipation of what lay ahead always made that task easier. It was a good place for Millard to keep his skeletons in the closet. That was the term his grandmother had used for secrets when he was a boy. The old lady had no idea how appropriate the metaphor would turn out to be. The unmistakable scent announced his arrival at the scene. Millard raised the flashlight to reveal the bloated, naked body of the woman he'd kidnapped and murdered, resting against a fallen log where he had posed it. He'd already disposed of her clothing and personal effects, burning items of identification and disposing her clothing in a donation bin located near his home. He positioned the light on the ground to illuminate the body and got down on his hands and knees. Staring at the feet of the corpse, he closed his eyes and followed the contour of his victim, sniffing the putrid stench of decomposition. When he reached the head, the loud buzzing of an insect prompted him to open his eyes. The woman's swollen visage was partially covered with a bloody foam oozing from her nose and mouth. From her left nostril, a large blowfly emerged from the foamy detritus, its shiny green thorax reflecting the flashlight's beam. The fly stubbornly clung to the dead woman's face, not allowing Millard's presence to interfere with his carry-on pursuit. He waved the fly away, but it quickly landed on the corpse's cheek. Millard repeated the action several times, but was unable to dissuade his tiny rival. Each time it was shooed away, it returned to reclaim its prize. The fly's strident buzzing was ruining the moment for him, forcing a change in sensory awareness from olfactory satisfaction to oral irritation. Millard got angrily to his feet and reached for the grocery bag. It was time to finish this. The blowfly was his constant companion during the dismemberment of the corpse. Each time, Millard moved to work on another body part. The fly shifted its attention to the same area. Its constant buzzing was like a drill in his brain. He broke one of his cardinal rules and rushed to separate the body into pieces. As he picked up the severed body parts and began to disperse them in the surrounding woods, the fly continued to follow him, a droning mourner for an inglorious requiem. Millard stripped off the coveralls and placed them in the garbage bag along with the gloves and chainsaw. Everything would disappear at different stops on the 50-mile trip back to his house. He flashed the light around and surveyed the scene one more time. Insects and scavengers would complete the rest of the cleanup for him. Satisfied, he began to walk back to the road. He'd only taken a few steps when he heard the now familiar jarring hum of the blowfly right near his ear. It circled his head twice and adjusted its flight to match his gait before landing on the bag of soiled protective clothing. Get out of here, you little son of a bitch, Millard muttered, shaking the bag to discourage the tiny hitchhiker. Once again, the blowfly had interfered with the killer's routine. Each step away from the scene brought him closer to his normal life. Whenever he was finished with a body, he would immediately start to compartmentalize the heinous acts he'd committed. He would place each murder on the highest shelf of his psyche inside a mental lockbox, hidden away from the husband and father who would soon take the serial killer's place. The fly was a psychogenic tether to the mutilated corpse left behind. Its constant murmur repeated a horrific tale of torture and death, and its ravenous appetite mirrored the compulsions of its human companion. The 
tide of repressed anger, which usually subsided with a kill, still roiled inside Millard. The blowfly was unrelenting in its attention to the plastic sack sanguine contents, and the murderer jerked the pliable bag back and forth in exasperation. Surely the damn thing would lose interest and find something else to feed on, he thought. After all, the forest was filled with dead things. Millard finally reached the logging road, and his flashlight found the van in the distance. The insect's incessant droning continued to assault his ears, even as he lost track of the pest's exact location. He quickened his pace to a jog, and the maddening buzzing grew fainter with each stride. He hurriedly opened the driver's side door, and with ambidextrous flair, tossed the sack into the passenger seat while slamming his door shut. Before starting the van, he leaned back onto the seat and took a moment to enjoy the silence. It was time for the blowfly to take its place in the mental lockbox and everything else that had happened in the past few days. With his attention focused on maneuvering the van back in the direction of the main road, Millard failed to notice the plump, shiny green stowaway emerged from the rumpled grocery bag beside him. It posed on the plastic surface and began to rub its front legs together in rapid succession. Its bulbous head was the next recipient of the insect's obsessive preening. The fly walked in short, jerky bursts along the edge of the black polyester seat and made its way to the passenger's headrest. It took flight by using the top of the seat as a launch pad. The clamorous return of the buzzing caused Millard to jerk his head reflexively toward the winged intruder. A small dark phantom was captured in his peripheral vision, heading toward the back seat. You little shit, he shouted. The vehicle's claustrophobic environment compounded the blowfly's offensive sound. Millard pushed the button that opened the passenger window and pressed his foot on the accelerator. Now get the hell out of here, he bellowed as the cool mountain air whipped through the van's interior. Millard's exasperation with the six-legged nuisance made him unmindful of his speed on the rough dirt road. A trickle of spittle glistened at the side of his mouth as he filled the van with obscenities directed at his unwelcome passenger. Without warning, the green fly landed near the serial killer's partially opened lips. He frantically waved his hand in front of his face and lost sight of the road. The van veered to the right and struck the side of a thick ponderosa pine, initiating a roll down a steep embankment and shattering the glass of the driver's side window. It rolled over twice and came to rest against a large granite rock. The lord awoke to the internal hum of the blowfly. It landed on his face and began to methodically explore each wound the wreck inflicted. He tried to raise a hand to brush it away, but discovered that he couldn't move his arms. Panicked, he realized he had no feeling beneath his neck. His head fell back against the seat and caught his reflection in the twisted rearview mirror. The flap of his scalp lay folded back on the top of his head, exposing the raw tissue underneath. Millard watched as the fly found his new area of interest. It rubbed its front hands together like a cartoon character preparing for a great feast. Many others would soon join it, and the serial killer's choice of such a secluded setting ensured that they'd be able to feed and lay their eggs in his imminent putrescence without being disturbed. I hope you enjoyed Blow Fly Blues, as written by Charles Williams and performed by Otis Jiry. On to the shows. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But 
Before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, X, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 